Okay, welcome back to 162, everybody. Um, we are going to do the third lecture we have uh, on scheduling today. And um, I definitely encourage you to catch up on uh, the other lectures if you've gotten behind since the midterm. Um, the, uh, one of the things we did talk about uh, last time, which I wanted to remind you of, was real-time scheduling. And um, normally when you hear about scheduling in an operating systems class, uh, you often just hear about sort of the standard performance uh, sensitive or latency sensitive, um, you know, responsiveness and fairness sensitive scheduling algorithms. But I always like to talk a little bit about real time because real time is different in that um, predictability is important. So rather than uh, what you typically worry about in scheduling, um, here it's far more important to be predictable than even to be fast. Okay, because you want to predict with confidence the worst case response time. And um, in real time scheduling, uh, performance guarantees are often given uh, per each task. You're sort of guaranteed a given deadline uh, will be met. And um, the way you get that guarantee is you have to give the scheduler information about what your worst case uh, scheduling time, uh, worst case computation time might be. Um, and in, in um, conventional systems, we talk about performance and you know, throughput's important, okay? And so real time's really about enforcing predictability. And it's important because, for instance, talking about things like uh, hard real time might show up if you're worried about um, physical world uh, scenarios, how long between when you press the brake on a car and when the uh, brakes actually engage, that might be a real time problem. And it's very important that you meet a deadline there because if you don't, then the user might crash. Now, there is a discussion here about GPU scheduling. We probably won't talk about that. We're mostly talking about um, regular uh, CPU scheduling for now. Um, the, uh, the thing about hard real-time scheduling, again, is it's really important to meet the deadline. And this can be a situation where if you don't meet deadlines, maybe the car crashes or uh, you have a system that's uh, in a hospital and maybe the patient dies if the real time scheduling is not met. And we even introduced something called earliest deadline first scheduling last time, uh, which is a very common one for doing real time scheduling. Um, we also sort of distinguished between hard and soft real time. The key thing about hard real time is it's crucial that you actually meet the deadlines and you assume that you don't want to miss any deadlines, whereas soft real time is a situation where you want to meet deadlines with high probability and typically might be in something like multimedia servers or whatever. And there's something that, like the constant bandwidth server, CBS, uh, which we didn't talk about last time, is a variant of earliest deadline first for multimedia. All right. The other thing that uh, we were talking about that I wanted to mention was stride scheduling. Stride scheduling is uh, something that we talked about after we talked about lottery scheduling. And this was the notion of achieving a proportional share of uh, scheduling without resorting to the type of randomness we talked about in the lottery scheduling, and uh, thereby sort of uh, overcoming the law of small numbers problem where um, uh, lottery scheduling really only comes out when you uh, have long enough tasks that you can, can meet that law of small numbers. Uh, law of large numbers basically stabilizes it. Um, the stride of each job you could think of as something like you have a large number divided by the number of tickets. And uh, for instance, W might be 10,000 and perhaps task A has 100 tickets, B has 50, C has 250. And in those instances, basically uh, the strides are, for instance, 100 for A, 200 for B and uh, 40 for C. And uh, what is that stride? We talked briefly about the fact that sort of every time you get to schedule, and run for your time slice, you, uh, you add your stride uh, to your counter. And um, those uh, tasks with the smallest accumulated stride are the ones that get to run. And so as you can imagine, the low stride jobs with lots of tickets run more often. And um, this is starting to get a way of uh, applying fair queuing to scheduling uh, and, and basically thereby giving a proportional fraction of the CPU. Okay, and really what I talked about a little bit too quickly at the end of lecture, because we ran out of time and I wanted to uh, repeat here for everybody, was this notion of the Linux uh, completely fair scheduler or CFS, uh, 
And this is uh, actually in use. You're probably using it if you have a Linux box. And the goal here is that each process gets an equal share of the CPU. So rather than talking about priority scheduling or, or uh, um, talking about round robin scheduling or some of the other ones we were talking about, which don't tie the schedule directly to the CPU, CFS, like stride scheduling, ties the amount of uh, execution time you get to the CPU. And so as a simple example, we'll get to more complicated ones in a second here, the idea here that n threads are running simultaneously, you have this model as if the CPU were subdivided into n pieces, and somehow we were able to get n pieces of the CPU to each of the n threads. And if you could somehow do that, then the threads would run uh, at exactly one over nth of the time, and they'd all get an equal fraction of the CPU, and everybody would be happy. Okay, and so the model is something like simultaneous multi-threading or hyper-threading, where each thread gets one over n of the cycles. Um, of course, in general, you can't do this. Uh, yeah, hyper-threading maybe lets you do that a little bit with one or two threads, but certainly not a big n. Um, and so what we need to do is figure out how to approximate this idea that every thread gets one over nth of the CPU, uh, but without having that ability to really subdivide those cycles. And so, of course, the operating system gives out full speed cycles. Uh, and so we have to use something other than the, some way of keeping the threads in sync so they sort of get on average one over n. And that's uh, really the basic idea here, which is we're gonna track CPU time per thread and schedule the threads to match up an average rate of execution. And so you could look at this. I mean, in this previous figure, what I had here was one over n uh, of the cycles are given to each thread. And so they all kind of progress at the same time, okay? In this newer idea here, the threads, of course, when they're running are running fast. They're faster than one over nth of the speed, but we don't run them all the time. And if we, when we stop, we can take a look at thread one, two, and three and notice uh, to make a scheduling decision here that thread two is behind in its average amount of cycles. And so we'll choose to schedule that one next. And so it's, uh, we've sort of keep the, the heads of the threads uh, running at the same speed on average. And so we choose the thread here with the minimum CPU time total. And this is very closely related to fair queuing as a general idea, if you're familiar with that uh, from networking. Okay. And uh, if we do that, so what we're just to be clear, what we're doing is whenever the thread gets to run, we're counting its total cycles. And then when we stop, uh, we put it back in the scheduling heap, and then we pick the thread that has the, the least number of cycles so far, and we keep doing this in a way so that on average we get the same uh, rate of execution between all of the threads. Okay, and you could imagine if you know, if you remember your 61B um, uh, ideas is that we probably want to heap like scheduling queues. So we just put the threads in the heap. And then the one at the top is the lowest, uh, has the lowest number of uh, total cycles. And it's the one that we schedule for next. All right, questions. So this is, we're, we're going after rate of execution here rather than those other metrics that we were going at before, like uh, you know, letting it just run for a little while and then switching it out after time expires. And I'll show you in a moment how we can now use this to give us something like priorities, but in a way that still maintains this notion of rate of execution rather than uh, strict priorities. Okay, questions? Okay, so Sleeping threads, of course, don't advance their CPU time. So what's interesting about this is that when they wake up and they're ready to run, they're way behind. And so they get selected to execute first. And as a result, we get this interactivity idea automatically. Uh, think of this in, in uh, contrast to the O1 scheduler. Uh, and does CFS have any concept of priority? Yes, just give me a second, I'll get to that. Um, but if you remember the O1 uh, scheduler, the idea was we had some really complicated heuristics uh, that would uh, adjust priorities based on how much interactivity we thought or how short the burst time seemed to be to try to make sure that things that had really short burst times and might be likely to be um, 
interactive tasks would get higher priority and get to run as soon as they became runnable. Here, we get this automatically just because we're trying to give the same rate to everybody. And if a thread is sleeping, it's not achieving its rate. So when it wakes up, suddenly it's got the CPU. Okay, so this is beginnings of why this was so appealing and why basically Linus and others uh, completely threw out the O1 scheduler for CFS because O1 had gotten way too complicated. So, um, so CFS has some nice properties uh, to it, but we, we still want to worry about a few things we talked about, for instance, starvation last time and responsiveness. And so in addition to trying to be fair about the rate of execution, we certainly want low response time to make sure that no thread left behind, right? And so starvation freedom might be another way to look at that. And so we want to make sure everybody gets to run at least a little bit. Uh, if you recall, when we were talking about multi-level queuing, there was this worry that the queue, the uh, thread sitting at the very bottom there in the lowest level queue might never get to run. So what CFS does is it actually uh, makes sure that everybody gets to run a little bit. And so it has something called the target latency, which is a period of time over which every process gets to run a little bit. Okay, and so call the quanta um, target latency over n in this case, that means that we make sure that every thread runs one over n to the time, and that makes sure from a time standpoint, we still have uh, the ability to um, you know, be sure we're going to run. Now, so far, it sounds like we're moving our way back into round robin, but just hold off. As soon as we get to uh, priorities, you'll see how this is fundamentally different. So for instance, uh, a target latency of 20 milliseconds is not out of the question for CFS. If you got four processes running, then each process gets five milliseconds time slice. Okay. And the problem that you might think here is if we have a 20 millisecond target latency, but 200 processes, then this all falls apart. And so CFS does have some outs, um, call it uh, a way to get by this high overhead case, right? And that's going to be that we're going to have a minimum quanta time. We never want our overhead to get so high that, for instance, 0.1 milliseconds is essentially what I told you a context switch time can be in some circumstances. So it would be really bad if we switched every context switch time. Okay. And so that's uh, basically a throughput metric. And so CFS has something called minimum granularity which is the minimum length of any time slice. And so the target latency, uh, 20 milliseconds, minimum granularity is one milliseconds. That says in this case of 200 processes, uh, we basically don't run anybody any shorter than a millisecond. Um, and so when, you're, when you have so many things running that you hit the minimum granularity, that's typically when the properties of CSS, the CFS uh, start to fall apart a little, okay? Um, but just so you know, there is this minimum granularity piece as well. Okay, priorities. Now, um, as those of you who have used Linux recently, it still has priorities. I wanted to tell you about what priority in Unix typically is, and that's the nice value. So the, uh, the industrial operating systems in the 60s and 70s gave you an actual priority that you could set directly. Um, when Berkeley Unix was kind of working on priority, they decided to call this nice instead, niceness. Okay, and so um, when we were talking about the O1 scheduler, we mentioned the fact that there were 40 priorities for the user. Um, those are actually called nice values, and they range from minus 20 to 19. There's 40 of them in there. And negative values are not nice. Uh, positive values are nice. And something that's more negative than another one gets higher priority, okay? So even um, if you were to look at priority 19 versus 18, the thing with the nice value of 18 is running with a slightly higher priority, okay? And um, so for instance, what you would do is you could start a job and then you could run nice on it. And uh, so if you wanted to let your friends get a little more time, you might do nice on your job and that would raise the niceness value. And, you could, and uh, however, only the uh, root user is allowed to lower nice, uh, the regular users are allowed to raise the nice values. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the scheduler puts higher nice values or lower priority to sleep more. And in the O1 one scheduler, this actually translated fairly directly to priority. If you remember, I showed you that there were 140 total priorities in the O1 one scheduler. 
the, the, uh, the highest hundred of them were for what was called real-time scheduling, okay? And the, uh, the lower 40 were for these nice values, okay? But how does this translate to CFS? So CFS was a drop-in replacement for the O1 scheduler. So clearly there was some notion of niceness that must have been there and priority is certainly useful because certain, certain things are higher priority than others. But this idea that CFS is a uh, fair queuing uh, type scheduler says that there must be something um, a little different here and because this is not strict priority. And so the idea here is that you're gonna change the rate of execution based on priority. You're not gonna say that higher priority always runs over lower priority, but instead higher priority has a higher rate of execution than lower priority, okay? So how does this work? So CFS, as I've shown you so far, isn't really all that different from round robin, okay? Because I kind of said, you know, you get one over nth of the CPU, you get a quantum that's uh, one over nth of the target latency. And so it sounds like I just renamed round robin, but in fact, I didn't, okay? What I did was um, I only showed you the uninteresting case where everybody has the same priority. Uh, but what if we want to give more CPU to some and less than others? What we're going to do is change the rate, okay? And so we're going to use weights for that. So what I showed you earlier was one in which the basic uh, quanta was uh, everybody got target latency time over N, and that was the, the basic equal shares, okay? A weighted share is something where every thread has a weight, and then what we do is we take uh, the current weight divided by the sum of all the weights to find out what fraction of the total weights a thread has times target latency, and that tells me my quanta. Okay, so now I'm adjusting the time that I'm allowed to run based on, uh, based to some extent on uh, target latency. And we're gonna reuse the nice values to reflect the share rather than the priority. So CFS uses nice values to scale the weights, but it does so exponentially, okay? Now this looks messy, but it's not bad. So just hear me out. So the idea is that the weight is uh, 1,024 divided by uh, 1.25 to the nice value. So what does this say? This says that positive nice values uh, have lower weights than negative nice values, okay? So a high weight basically, um, is going to be something that uh, has a, so as you see here, so a high nice value has a low weight and a low nice value has a high weight, okay? And so two CPU tasks separated by nice value of five, which you find is the one with the lower nice value has three times the weight of the one with the higher. And that's doesn't matter where it is. So if you have 19 versus 14 or zero versus minus five, you're still going to get the, the same proportional difference there, okay? And now we're gonna use virtual runtime instead of CPU time, okay? And the virtual runtime, um, why 1,024? Because they did. Um, the, the thing to realize here is it doesn't matter what the number 1,024 is. We could put any number we want here because the only way we use it is uh, with the same uh, number in the numerator and denominator, okay? And so, um, yeah, this is more about wanting integers than it is about anything else. Okay, but the 1,024s end up canceling out in this weighted share number. So the actual number is more of a uh, convenience for the number of bits you have in your weight than anything else. All right. Now, um, so just to give some of these numbers uh, uh, to you, just for the heck of it, if you have a target latency of 20 milliseconds, minimum granularity of a millisecond, um, and you have two CPU bound threads, which are always running, then A, um, might have a weight of uh, one and B might have a weight of four. How does that work? Well, with the target wet latency of 20 milliseconds, then these two weights, which would come from that exponential uh, factor I gave you earlier, means that the time slice for A might be four and for B might be 16. So notice B has a bigger time slice than A, okay? And they're in the ratio one to four. Now, so let's go back now to the fair queuing aspect. Okay, so fair queuing, how do we fit the rate of execution back into the picture here? Because so far we're talking about time of execution, but that isn't rate. So to fit the rate of execution back in the picture, 
what we want is we want somehow to give a slightly faster CPU to things with higher weight. Okay, and so if you look here, um, uh, here's an example where we want to give, say, more time to the higher weight than the lower weight one. But to do our, our CFS scheduling, what we're going to do is we want to schedule this in a way that we can put everybody in the same heap, no matter what their weight is, and always pick the one that has the lowest uh, amount of time so far. And so what we do is we schedule virtual time instead of uh, real time. So this is kind of cool. So uh, listen to me for a sec here. So what you do is um, for higher weight, the virtual runtime increases more slowly. And for lower weight, it increases more quickly. So if you think about that, a higher weight, I let the CPU run for a second, but I only will um, look at, say, a quarter of a second worth of virtual time. Whereas for the lower weight one here, if I run for a second, I will register a second of virtual time. If I put those together into my um, virtual CPU and I make sure that virtual time always advances at the same rate, then voila, now the ones with the higher weights get to run more time than the ones with the lower rates. And it does it in this very simple scheduling uh, idea here where I just want to make sure every thread has the same virtual CPU time. Okay, so scheduler's decisions are based on virtual CPU time. Um, it turns out you, you take the amount of time you just ran when you give up the CPU, you divide it by your weight, and you register that virtual time, and then you put yourself back in the heap. And uh, it turns out they use a red-black tree uh, to do this, uh, which is a convenient heap that I'm sure you've learned about. Um, it Basically, you can always find the next thread to run in 01 because it's at the, the top of the heap. And then you run it for a while, and you do this same trick. Okay, and now, by the way, the question here that's in the chat is, does this assume that um, every process has only one thread? So this scheduling decision is based per thread, not per process right now, okay? And uh, if you wanted to have some tie to the processes, then what you would do is you would adjust uh, their total weights to reflect that, okay? So you can, you can basically scale their weights to do some process-based scheduling if that's what you were desiring. All right. Now, the, in a um, contrast to the O1 scheduler, which every task that the O1 scheduler was doing was uh, independent of the number of threads, because we're using a heap, the scheduling time here is order log n, but log n isn't too bad. And the net result, though, is this incredibly simple schedule. OK, so notice that priorities are reflected by um, a, a greater fraction of the CPU cycles or a greater rate of execution. Um, that thing about interactivity just happens because when you go to sleep and you wake up, your virtual time is behind, and so you get to run right away. And so all of the really complex heuristics that were in the O1 scheduler have been replaced by this very simple idea of scheduling virtual time. All right. Any questions? So by the way, if a thread schedules uh, spawns too many, or if a process spawns too many threads, then, um, then the operating system can make a decision about whether to shut them down or not. Questions? So this is a fair queuing with execution rate mechanism of scheduling. All right. So just to, to close out this scheduling idea, so I wanted to go through the CFS in a little bit more detail because this is um, an actual scheduler that you're probably using now that works pretty well. It's not a real-time scheduler because it's working with rates of execution. So if you want a real-time scheduler, um, you could install, for instance, uh, you know, earliest deadline first scheduler on Linux, and you could use that. Um, so is there a cap on how much interactivity boost that a long running thread can have? Yes. So if you get too far behind, then there is, there is a little bit of a reset that goes on there. But uh, um, for, short, for short shutdowns, it doesn't happen that way. OK. Now, um, if you care about. CPU throughput, you might use first come, first serve, because that's the one that uses the things in the most efficient way. If you care about average response time, then you might want um, some approximation to SRTF, because remember, SRTF is optimal. IO throughput, excuse me, you might use an SRTF approximation. Fairness, well, you might use CFS. Or if you're caring about the wait time to get to a CPU, perhaps you'd use round robin. If you're interested in meeting deadlines, you probably use EDF. Um, uh, one thing we didn't talk about in this class is rate monotonic scheduling, which is a type of 
scheduling that's not as optimal as EDF, but you can actually do rate monotonic scheduling with a strict uh, priority scheduler like we talked about um, is the top 100 uh, priorities in Linux. And so you might do that instead of EDF. Um, if you're interested in favoring important tasks, you might use a strict priority scheduler. Okay. All right. So a final word on scheduling before we move on to, to another topic is when do the details of the scheduling policy and fairness really matter? When there aren't enough resources to go around. So everything we've been talking about for scheduling is all about how do you choose to divide up your resources among a bunch of shared threads? If you didn't care about resources, you wouldn't have to schedule. Um, or if you didn't care about, uh, you know, if you didn't have more than, if you had one thread, for instance, that's what I meant to say, you wouldn't have to schedule. Okay, so when there aren't enough resources to go around, your scheduling policy might start to get really important. Okay, um, and that's when you really have to be careful about your scheduler. Okay. Um, when should you just buy a faster computer? So it could be the case that um, your resources are so scarce and you have so many things you have to run that your computer is just not fast enough. Um, and you know this goes with pretty much everything. Uh, when might you need another network link or expand your highway or any, any number of questions around the rates of uh, restricted resources are all um, about how do you schedule and then if scheduling starts to fail, when do you buy bigger, faster, uh, larger things? Okay. Um, one approach is you buy it when it's going to pay for itself in improved response time. Um, perhaps you're paying for the uh, for worse response time and reduced productivity, customers being unhappy, et cetera. Um, you might think you should buy a faster uh, something when something's utilized 100% because then you know you you can't utilize it anymore. Um, but uh, I want to tell you that running anything at 100% is always bad, okay? Um, you as an engineer should know that you never want to run anything uh, at 100% if there's any randomness in the system at all. And the reason is that you start getting this queuing behavior like I've shown you in the curve here. Now we're going to talk about queuing theory in more depth uh, in a little, uh, in a few weeks. Um, actually, we may talk a little bit about it next week. but. Um, in general, you see a curve that looks like this with utilization on the x-axis, something like response time on the y-axis, and a, uh, a non-linear curve that starts out with a, a linear section in the low part, but then rapidly starts rising. Okay, And in, when you're looking at the, the regular models that um, aren't realistic but totally mathematical, this, uh, this high end near 100% goes to infinity. Of course, we know nothing goes to infinity in real life, but it always goes pretty high, okay? And so 100% is definitely not the time at which you wanna buy something because you're already seeing this huge super linear increase in response time. So your customers have already left you, right? So an interesting application, um, we'll tell you where the curve comes from in another lecture, but here, um, one thing might be to say, well, as long as I'm in the linear portion of utilization, things are basically okay, okay? The moment I start getting to the point where it's super linear and things are going up faster than they were in the linear section, that's when I start uh, to worry about my resources. So right around the knee of the curve is usually a good place to um, consider buying something new, okay? And just to give you another instance of 100% being a bad idea, if you know that a bridge can handle some maximum weight, say, call it you know, 200 tons, um, you do not want to be running at 100% on that bridge because you know that any sort of randomness is going to take you over the edge. right? You want to be running down in the linear place where the bridge is behaving normally. Okay. All right. Good. Questions? We'll tell you why this curve is super linear in a, in a couple of lectures. OK. Um, so I actually had this is still grading when I did these slides earlier today, but um, I believe the grading is pretty close to done. Um, so we'll get those out to you. There's also, um, I, I know people have been waiting for the bins. Those bins are out. Um, there's going to be a little bit, uh, those bins represent final total points as they do in other classes, but um, for midterms, there is a, um, an offset that you can uh, use with the midterm from historical data that will let you interpret kind of how you did on the midterm 
um, and we'll explain that uh, later in a post. Uh, but I will say that having we graded this and this midterm was clearly too long, and I apologize for that. It was definitely uh, definitely hard, uh, harder than I think we were expecting. So um, I guess we'll figure that out for the next one. So my apologies there. Um, the uh, other thing is group evaluations. Oh, and, and just to cap this off, I believe you'll be seeing the um, release of grade scope grades in, in uh, either tonight or maybe even uh, early tomorrow, but very soon. And that'll be uh, the process. Then you can start um, putting in uh, grade, regrade requests and so on. Um, group evaluations uh, are coming up for project one. In fact, they may have been mailed out today or they will be tomorrow at the latest. Every person uh, in the evaluations are gonna get 20 points per other partner, which you can hand out as you wish. No points to yourself, okay? Every term I have to say no points to yourself. So this is not about saying, well, I've got four people in my group, 20 times four is 80, I'm gonna give 80 points to myself, okay? That doesn't work that way. <laughs> the way it works is you have three other partners Three times 20 is 60, and you can hand those 60 points out anyway to your other partners. They're going to evaluate you, okay? And um, the reason we do this, and by the way, your TAs are going to moderate what's, uh, what's being said here. This is just one piece of information that we use to figure out how things are going. But in principle, uh, projects are a zero-sum game, and you have to participate in your group. Okay, and there are some of you that seem to have fallen off the earth and aren't responding to email. Uh, if you really don't participate at all, and we have that documented in various ways, then um, it, it's possible that some of your points may end up going to your partners instead of to you. So um, this doesn't happen often, but it's a way for us to really uh, reward project members that um, are working and uh, have non working uh, team members, okay? So please try to try to work. Um, make sure that if there are any group dynamic issues that your TA knows, um, and I, I think I offered that I'd be more than happy to sit down with groups to talk about uh, ways of collaborating if that helps. Um, but make sure your TA knows any issues that you might be having with your group. And um, let's see if we can make projects two and three even better. Um, so are the point distributions per person anonymous? So um, the point distributions are in fact not uh, handed out at all. So those are purely for our information. Um, they, none of your team members know how you graded them and they don't, um, and you don't know how they graded you. Um, but you're gonna uh, talk to your TAs and their TAs will have a good idea how you're doing as well, okay? Um, the, uh, the other thing uh, just to say about this is, you know, if you were 100% happy with your group members, you could give your other three partners or whatever 20 points each, and that would be an example of a uh, fully, um, a very happy person uh, with the rest of their group, okay? The other thing I mentioned was this notion of a group coffee hour. Uh, look for opportunities, uh, I think in maybe the same email um, that we send out either group evaluations or our uh, how are we doing a third of the way through the term uh, survey? Um, we're gonna tell you how to basically give it, get, maybe get extra points for screenshots of you uh, with uh, your other team members on Zoom, um, you know, thumbs up or uh, beverage of choice or whatever. We're gonna call these group coffee hours, okay? And don't forget to turn cameras on for discussion sessions uh, if, if at all possible. All right. That was a long administrivia. Um, I realize it's uh, really rough being in a fully virtual term and you know, a third of the way through the term, this is the point at which things start getting, uh, they seem hard and uh, you, people you sort of hit a, a slow point, but let's, let's get our excitement back up and get moving. And I know we have a bunch of really exciting topics still in the class, so. And I apologize that that uh, midterm was too long. I think we haven't uh, fully figured out how to deal with uh, virtual virtual midterms yet. All right. Good. So let's change topics. So let's talk about deadlock. Uh, I like to think of this as a deadly type of starvation. 
So starvation, as we've been talking about with scheduling uh, as, as our uh, main instance, certainly last time, is a situation where a thread waits indefinitely. An example might be a low priority thread waiting for resources constantly in use by a high priority thread. Of course, the principal resource being CPU, but other things can be there too. Um, this is a situation that could potentially resolve itself as soon as all the high priority threads are gone. So it isn't a permanent scenario, but it certainly might be annoying and it might be um, you know, not what you want because your thread's not running. Deadlock, on the other hand, is an unresolvable situation that's a starvation situation. And it, and it involves a circular waiting for resources. So if you look here, we have a situation where thread A is waiting for resource two, but resource two is owned by thread B and thread B is waiting for resource one, but resource one is owned by thread A. So here's a cycle. And as a result of this cycle, uh, both thread A and B are uh, sleeping and will never wake up, okay? Because, you know, A will never get notified that resource two is ready and B will never get notified that resource one is ready and uh, nobody resolves itself and uh, nobody's happy, okay? So notice that deadlock is a type of starvation, but not vice versa, okay? And again, starvations can end. They don't have to, but they can. Deadlocks can't. There's no way to fix this cycle I'm showing you here without fundamentally doing something drastic, like thread A killing it off. Then thread B could run. Or, um, I don't know, trying to figure out how to temporarily take a resource away from somebody uh, and then give it back. Okay, and both of those situations are usually bad. Just randomly killing a thread uh, probably isn't what you want to do. And randomly taking a resource away from somebody probably gives you bad behavior, okay? So um, what's a good example of a resource other than locks and semaphores? So we'll talk about uh, memory, uh, you know, disk blocks, pick any resource you like, a queue, um, you know, th anything that uh, you might wait for uh, is a situation where you might be in a pro uh, run into problems, okay? Now, um, you know, another example could be that you're waiting for a particular CPU in some special machine that's uh, attached in a, in a way to some hardware that other CPUs aren't attached to. That could be an important resource that you're waiting for. So pretty much anything that you need to complete your task that uh, might need to be exclusively owned counts as a resource here. Okay. Did that help? Now, um, here's the simplest example. Uh, here's a bridge. We have a lot of these in California. Um, I was just uh, out driving the roads last weekend and uh, encountered one road where there was like three of these single lane bridges, uh, all because parts of the road had washed out and uh, they never got fixed from the last rainy season. So that's unfortunate. But um, you could imagine that uh, this might be a, a source of deadlock under some circumstances. So for instance, you could view each segment of the road as a resource. Car has to own the resource that's under it, of course, and they may need to acquire the segment they're moving into in order to make any progress. Okay, so um, for instance, if you have a bridge and let's just divide it in two halves, you have to acquire both halves and traffic only in one direction at a time is clearly gonna be required for that. So here's a, here's a bridge situation uh, where there's two halves we have two cars that are um, on each half and we have a bad situation here because um, the two cars are uh, meeting in the middle and can't make any progress. Okay, and I've shown you here a, a cycle. You know, we have the minivan is trying to get the Eastern half of the bridge and we have the uh, race cars trying to get the Western half of the bridge. The minivan owns the Western half because it's on it and the, and the uh, race car owns the Eastern half because it's on it and we have a cycle. Okay, and um, how do we resolve this deadlock? Well, if we wanna resolve the deadlock in a way that's uh, reasonable, one of the cars has to back up. Um, amusingly enough, uh, if you get two people that are unwilling to back up, then you get a long-term honking going on. Um, the other thing to note, by the way, is because of the ownership of resources uh, prior, it's possible that, for instance, in order for the green car to back up, other cars have to back up. And so there may be a whole chain of resources that have to be 
relinquished and reacquired only in order to undo that deadlock. Okay, and those of you that might have taken a database course like 168 or something like that might recognize that um, 164 might recognize the situation as some sort of undo or transaction abort. Okay, 186. That's what I meant. Sorry, I'm being uh, I'm being swapped tonight. Uh, so. The other thing that can show up in this scenario is starvation. If for some reason one direction, say uh, you know east to, or west to east, is just going so fast that no other car gets in, that's actually a type of starvation here, not deadlock, because um, you know as soon as there's no more of that traffic, then the other traffic can go. All right. So let's look at. Um, deadlock with locks here, since uh, this seems like the simplest thing to start looking at. So here, here are two threads. Um, yeah, this is a situation where the municipality might need another lane, right? Well, as I mentioned on that road I was on, literally uh, there couldn't be another lane because it was, it was uh, washed out and there was um, just those Jersey barriers around there to prevent you from going into the creek. So um, I would say the local municipality uh, wasn't able to fix it. Um, so here's a situation where thread A and thread B um, look as follows. They both are have mutex X and Y, but thread A does an acquire uh, of X and an acquire of Y. It does some stuff, then it releases Y and then releases X. Thread B, on the other hand, acquires Y and then acquires X, does some stuff, releases uh, X, releases Y. So this lock pattern seems simple. Uh, it seems like something you could write by accident if you weren't thinking about it, because you got two resources, X and Y, you need them both. Uh, you write one in one order and the other in the other order. And um, the problem with this is that this is a non-deterministic failure. Okay, and there's nothing worse than writing something that fails non-deterministically, because you can't reproduce it to start with. I'm sure some of you have started to run into problems like that in, uh, in the code that you're writing. And um, you know, and the other worst thing is it's going to occur at the worst possible time. Now, if you remember when I was telling you about um, the Murphy's Law scheduler or the malicious scheduler view, this is a situation where um, the scheduler will find uh, the bad situation and they'll do it at the worst possible time. Now, let me show you a little bit about the unlucky case. So thread A acquires X. Thread B acquires Y. Now notice the interleaving going on here, right? Thread A tries to acquire Y, but it's stalled because it, Y is acquired by B. Thread B tries to acquire X, but it's stalled. And now um, the rest of that code never runs, okay? So this is a deadlock. And if you notice here, so thread A is kind of waiting for mutex Y and thread B is waiting for mutex X. And neither of these are going to give it up. And so basically, we are stalled. OK? Neither thread gets to run. We've got deadlock. But let's look at the lucky case. Oops, sorry about thread A and B. So the lucky case here, thread A acquires X and Y. Then thread B comes along and acquires Y. Uh, it tries to acquire Y, but notice that it's uh, stuck. OK, and then thread A releases Y and releases X. Then B finally gets to acquire Y, then it acquires X and it runs, and the schedule doesn't trigger deadlock. And if you think about what's involved in getting that exact deadlock case to happen, well, the scheduler has to line up at exactly the wrong time with this previous case here to get the deadlock. Most of the time, it won't happen, and you'll get the lucky case. So here you are, you ship something to customers, um, and uh, you get a call at 3.37 in the morning because the thing has deadlocked because most of the time you're seeing the lucky case, but you didn't see the unlucky case when you were testing, okay? And the larger amount of code that isn't in your lock uh, case, so like here, you know, we have a few instructions here doing locking, but we have a lot of code maybe in the critical section and a lot of code outside the critical section you know, it's from a probability standpoint, it's just not a high probability event, but boy, when it happens, you are toast. Okay. Questions. <laughs>
All right. Everybody good? Now, let me show you another case. So here's, a, here's another circular dependency that's a little bit different, but it's similar, OK? And I'll tell you why I'm calling this a wormhole-rooted network in a moment. But for now, this is there is some trains here. They're long trains. There's a little tiny train over there, too. But these long trains stretch uh, for a, wh a while, since they're long. And what we've got here is each train is trying to turn right so this, uh, this eastern facing train is trying to go south, the south train is trying to go west, the west train is trying to go north, the north train is trying to go east. And they're blocked because uh, the resource they need, which is, for instance, this uh, west-east train is trying to grab that segment um, immediately after the turn, but it can't because there's a train in it. Okay. And this is actually a very similar problem to what you get in a multiprocessor network. Okay, so this is a situation where um, where you've got uh, basically a wormhole rooted network uh, with messages that trail through the network like a worm. So instead of trains, what we've got is we've got a routing flit at the head, and then the the body of the messages kind of stretch out all the way back to the source of the messages. Okay, so that's called wormhole rooted networking because it looks like a worm, and it's rooted uh, as that worm all the way through the network. Okay, and here we've just developed a deadlock. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, what you do in the network case, this may not be as practical in uh, a train, except maybe in the metropolitan area, is you you make a grid that extends in all directions, and then you force an ordering of the channels. Okay, and the protocol will be you always go east-west first, and then north-south. Okay, so um, what we've just done is we've disallowed by this rule these two uh, parts of the turn. So this red turn here and this red turn there. So you're not allowed to go north first and then east. You're also not allowed to go south first and then west. And by disallowing those two turns, you will never get deadlock because you can't fundamentally get a, a cycle out of it. In fact, you can even write a proof that shows that this network has no deadlocks in it because a deadlock would require a cycle, and a cycle would always require uh, at least one of these disallowed turns. Okay. Now again, this is not as practical in a train network, but certainly in a network network, if you have a mesh, what you can say is I always have to route east-west first and then north-south, and as a result, you can end up uh, with no deadlocks. Okay. Question. All right. Now, um, by the way, this is a real XY routing is a real thing, or you look up dimension ordered routing. Um, there are uh, there are real networks that behave that way, including uh, you know the interior networks that are um, a part of the Intel chips. So um, this is a this is a real thing, and it's a way of avoiding deadlock. So it's kind of nice because you can avoid it mathematically. Uh, other types of deadlocks, there are many of them, right? So threads block waiting for resources like locks and terminals and print printers and uh, drives and memory. Um, threads might be blocked waiting for other threads like pipes and sockets. Um, you can deadlock pretty much on anything like that. And all it requires is getting some sort of cycle involved. Okay. So we might want to figure out a little bit about how to avoid these kind of deadlocks. OK, so here's an example of one with space, right? So here, thread A is going to do an allocator wait one megabyte and then another megabyte and then free, free, and thread does the same thing. Well, if there's only two megabytes total of space, you can imagine that A gets a megabyte, then B gets a megabyte, and uh, we're now deadlocked in just the same uh, cycle as before, but it looks a little different, OK? And we'll talk about how to think about cycles that uh, that have resources where there's multiple equivalent pieces of the same resource in a little bit. So in order to move our way along this, let's talk about what I like to call the dining lawyers problem. So we have five chopsticks and five lawyers okay, in a really cheap restaurant. And it's a free for all. So what we do is we put one chopstick in between each lawyer. okay. And um, the lawyers are going to grab, and by the way, uh, nothing against lawyers. This is just the example here. But you need two chopsticks to eat. And um, if everybody grabs the chopstick on their right, we now have deadlock because nobody can, can eat. Okay. 
So that's a, that's a deadlock. It's a larger cycle than just uh, you, you know, two resources and two threads, but it's still a deadlock because there's a cycle. So how do you fix the deadlock? Well, you could make one of them give up a chopstick and eventually everybody gets a chance to eat. Oh, and by the way, this is such a cheap restaurant that you have to share the uh, chopsticks after they've been used and you put them down. So perhaps during a pandemic, you wouldn't want to do this solution. Um, how do you prevent a deadlock? Well, that's more interesting, right? So the way you might prevent a deadlock here is to never let a lawyer take the last chopstick if no hungry lawyer has two chopsticks afterwards. Now, wait a minute, what does that mean? If you never let a lawyer take the last chopstick, if as a result of taking that, no other lawyer has two chopsticks, then you know that there's always somebody that can finish dinner and lay down their two chopsticks and then let somebody else go forward. Okay, so there is a solution to this that involves uh, looking ahead that maybe we can formalize in some way, okay? But to do that, we need to talk a little bit more about deadlock. So what is required? What's the minimum requirements to run into a deadlock? Well, first and foremost, mutual exclusion is a requirement. So that says that we have resources that can be possessed exclusively by a thread such that um, no other thread can use them, okay? So uh, remember, we've been talking about mutual exclusion as a way of keeping uh, a uh, multiple threads out from the middle of a particular block of code. This is the same idea, but this is for general resources. We're saying that we have resources that can be mutually held onto by one thread and requested by another, but not acquired until the first thread's done with them. That's mutual exclusion. The second is this idea of hold and wait, which says that if a thread has multiple resources, it's already acquired and it's waiting to acquire another one, then it's gonna hold on to all the resources that it's got. So it's, what happens is it grab, grab, grab resources, tries to grab the next one and it can't, but it's gonna hold on to all the other ones, okay? So you need to not only have mutual exclusion of resources, but you gotta be able to uh, have a situation where you hold them and wait on them. There also needs to be a situation with no preemption. So not only do you hold resources uh, while you're waiting for other ones, but it's not possible to take a resource away from somebody. And that's kind of like, if you think about the bridge example, um, what, would be, uh, what would be a preemption case there? Well, that would be Godzilla comes by, grabs one of the cars that is honking and uh, tosses it into the other valley. And now we've just broken the deadlock, okay? So we're assuming that something like that can't happen. I'm assuming you all know who Godzilla is, but perhaps I'm dating myself on that. And the third thing there's, you need, or fourth thing, excuse me, is you need to have a circular weight where there exists some set of threads that are waiting, T1 through N, where T1's waiting for something held by T2, T2's waiting for something held by T3, et cetera, TN is waiting for something held by T1, et cetera, all right? And now, as a result, um, we, uh, we have a cycle, okay? If you don't have a cycle of waiting, there is no deadlock. Now, what I wanna make sure I'm clear on here is you can have all these things and not have deadlock, but if you don't have one of these things, you don't have deadlock, okay? So these are uh, minimum requirements, but they're not sufficient. They're just, they're just necessary, okay? So we're getting somewhere. And if you were to think through all of the examples of deadlock I've shown so far, uh, it had all of these properties to it. So let's talk about how to detect deadlock. And to do that, we're gonna build a resource allocation graph. So here's our model. We have uh, threads, which are gonna be uh, circles with T sub something in them. We're gonna have resources, which are gonna be rectangles and uh, we'll call them R1, R2, et cetera. And notice the number of dots in the rectangle represents the number of uh, instances of that resource in the system. So these are all equivalent, excuse me. So in the case of memory, remember that example I showed you a little bit ago, where we were allocating one megabyte and then one megabyte and then one megabyte. Each megabyte is equivalent in those instances. So we would build that as a rectangle with a bunch of dots representing all the equivalent megabytes and we'd call that a resource, okay? Um, the resources which were mutexes or locks that we were talking about earlier might be an example here of a, a square with a single dot in it, okay? Every thread is gonna utilize a resource by first requesting it, then using it, then releasing it. 
okay? And this notion of request, use, release is kind of that, that idea of mutual exclusion where between request and release, if I'm in the use phase, uh, nobody else can use that particular resource, but that means a particular dot is now used, not all of the resources that are equivalent, okay? So our resource allocation graph is very simple, okay? It's, uh, it's partitioned into two types of nodes, T nodes and R nodes. And we're gonna build that graph where there's a request edge, uh, which is sort of T1 to RJ. And that basically says that thread one wants resource J or an assignment edge RJ to T1, TI, which basically says that RJ is owned by TI, okay? And that's gonna build a graph for us. And then we're gonna go through that graph and figure out whether we have deadlock, okay? I have some examples here. So remember the model is request edge and assignment edges. And so here's a simple example. So here's an example of threads one, two, and three. Thread one uh, is requesting resource one. That's what this uh, request edge looks like. Here we have an assignment edge, R1 is owned by T2. Okay, so this is, and everybody see that? So here's an instance where R4, there's three possibilities there, but only one of them is currently owned by T3. Okay, everybody with me so far? Now, once we have a graph like this, then we can do graph operations on it and very quickly decide whether it's deadlocked. So for instance, here's an example of a graph with a deadlock. Now it's not your simple deadlock, um, but if you look here, it's got um, T1 is waiting for R1, but R1's owned by T2. Uh, R3 is owned by T1, one of the instances, and the other instance of R3 is owned by T2. T2 is waiting for R2, but R2 is waiting for T is owned by T3. And finally, T3 is uh, waiting for R3. And if you look at this scenario, this is an unresolvable situation where there's no way that any of the threads can advance and make forward progress. Okay. Now, so good question. Uh, so the question was, so a cycle leads to deadlock? No, a deadlock needs a cycle. Very important here. A cycle is merely necessary for deadlock, not sufficient. So for instance, good question. I, I uh, clearly paid him for uh, to ask that question. If you look here, here's an example of a cycle, but no deadlock. So notice that T1 is waiting for R1 R1 is owned by T3, one of R1s is owned by T3. T3 is waiting for R2, one of the R2s is owned by T1. So there's a cycle here. But what we also see is that if T4 finishes, it'll free up an R2 and then T3 can get what it needs and it'll finish and then it can fit, uh, free up an R1 and then T1 can finish. So just because you have a cycle doesn't mean you have a deadlock. But if you have a deadlock, you know you have a cycle. All right, good. So uh, now we have, we're armed and we can figure out how to detect deadlock, right? So here's a simple algorithm. And what it, it, the key thing about this algorithm is just understanding the, um, the symbols here. So I'm gonna have a vector of resources. So this is a vector. It's gonna be a comma, a comma separated list. And for each resource, R1, R2, R3, R4, um, I'm gonna say how many of those resources are free. So in this case here, R1 and R2 are completely taken. So we're gonna have zero comma zero. Um, we also have uh, current requests from thread X. Um, so if you notice, for instance, T1 is currently requesting an R1, so we're going to, um, but it's uh, not requesting an R2. So the request for uh, T1 is gonna be one comma zero. The allocation for T1, well, it owns an R2, but not an R1, the allocation will be zero comma one, okay? So these are just vectors of free resources, numbers of free resources, and how much being requested and how much is allocated by each thread. So if you can get past that, then it's very easy to do this. We just uh, do a list-based algorithm where um, we set the we say the total number of available resources is the vector of free resources. Uh, we put all the nodes, um, excuse me, I should say all the threads into the unfinished uh, bin. And then we're gonna do, we're gonna start by saying, well, I'm done equal true. And then I'm gonna go through and for every node that's in the unfinished bin, I'm gonna say, well, is there enough uh, nodes available, enough resources available of each type that I can get what I want, my, I'm currently requesting, 
And if the answer is yes, then I, fin I figure out that as a thread, I can get all of those resources. Um, so I'm going to be able to finish. And I'm going to remove the node from the unfinished bin. And then I'm going to add all of its resources back into the available pot, because I'm now done. I'm going to say uh, with that thread, I'm going to say that I'm done with this algorithm. I'm going to set it to false. And, uh, and then I'm going to go keep going. And when I'm done with the first do loop, I'm going to say, gee, did, was there any thread that finished as a result of going through? If the answer is uh, no, then I'm done. And as a result, I've got uh, some nodes left and unfinished, and I'm deadlocked because there's no way to finish this. On the other hand, if I did pull a thread out in that pass, I go back and try it again, and I just keep looping as long as threads are finishing. And if I eventually finish everybody, then um, I know there's no deadlock. OK, so how do I know there's no deadlock? Because there is a path where threads can complete one at a time, and will eventually everybody will be finished, and I won't exceed the, uh, the total resources in the system. And each thread, as it finishes, puts the resources back in the pot, and, um, and then uh, potentially those can be used by other threads. OK, and if I did that, let's see. Um, so the question here uh, is basically, this is all fine and dandy, but is it possible that uh, we could have a situation where w one thread gets a resource, uh, and as a result, uh, other threads can't finish, and you end up with deadlock? I think that was the question. And the answer here is, if you notice, this deadlock algorithm is very careful. Okay, It's saying, if a thread can get all of the things it needs, all of it, right? All of its requested re remaining resources it can get them all at once. Then I'll declare it finished and put all of its uh, resources back in the pot. And then as a result, I haven't prevented anybody else from running. All I've done is freed up my own resources, which they might potentially use. Okay, so this particular deadlock detection algorithm is saying, is there any path that I could take through the threads that would uh, let them all finish? Okay, did that answer that question? Great. So, um, how do we? So we can detect deadlock, but how do we deal with it? Oh, by the way, um, can anybody tell me if I run this algorithm and I see there is no deadlock according to this algorithm? Does that mean that all threads will finish? <laughs> I've got both yes and no on here. Okay. Anybody want to argue? Both with a question mark. Nobody wants to argue. Okay. So the answer to this is no, but it's not the fault of the algorithm. Okay. You got to be careful about what is this algorithm telling me? It's telling me that if the threads are asking for resources they need, they use the resources, they free them up, then other threads can go forward. We're all happy. But if a thread goes into an infinite loop or something else happens or doesn't free up the resources for some reason, then this algorithm really doesn't tell you anything, right? So this, this algorithm is assuming that the threads are um, really just a, requesting resources and freeing them up and not doing anything else stupid like going into an infinite loop, OK? So or asking for more things than they originally said they need, OK? So this is. This is a very restricted algorithm, algorithmic result here, OK? Now, how should a system deal once it's discovered deadlock? OK, we have four approaches here that I wanted to mention. One is deadlock prevention. So this is a situation where you write your code in a way so it will never deadlock. OK, now I think I showed you that earlier uh, when we talked about removing the cycles from the network by uh, eliminating certain directions of travel, right? So that would be a prevention scenario. Um, deadlock recovery is a situation where you let the deadlock happen and then you figure out how to recover from it. Okay, that's the Godzilla approach. Right? Deadlock avoidance is dynamically delay the resource request so that even though in principle you could get a deadlock, it doesn't happen. And then finally, I like to put this last one out because this one's important and you should all know this exists. I call this deadlock denial or deadlock denialism. Okay, so this is ignoring the possibility of deadlock and claiming that it never happens. 
Okay, and um, so modern operating systems kind of make sure the system itself isn't involved in any deadlocks and then pretty much ignores all the other deadlock and applications. I like to call this the ostrich algorithm. Okay, uh, so this is why sometimes you have something running and you got to reboot the operating system to fix something. Okay, that that oftentimes is because there's some deadlock that nobody uh, planned for, nobody detected, and nobody uh, had any way to deal with other than just rebooting things. Okay, and unfortunately, that's a much more common than you might think. All right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, prevention here, for instance. So one thing you could do is put infinite resources together. Okay, so that's uh, you know infinite's big, right? But um, what we're really saying is you include enough resources so that no one ever really runs out of them. It doesn't have to be infinite, just really big, and you give the illusion of infinite resources. So a nice example of that might be virtual memory, which under most circumstances appears pretty big, right? Um, Another somewhat less practical example might be the Bay Bridge with 12,000 lanes, you never wait. Okay, so that might be nice. Um, never gonna happen, right? Infinite disk space. Well, we're pretty close to that in a lot of instances, right? You can buy uh, 100 terabyte um, disk drive these, di these days uh, that's using flash memory, and uh, that's pretty big, okay? Um, you could decide to never share resources. If you think about the cycles we're talking about earlier, um, cycles require that there's a resource that's being used by one person that is uh, needed by somebody else, right? If you never have any need for sharing, you'll never have any deadlock because you can't come up with a cycle. Another option would be never allow waiting. So notice what I'm doing here, by the way, is I'm removing uh, one of those four requirements for deadlock, right? So not allowing waiting is really how uh, phone systems work. It used to be a lot more common. Uh, it still happens occasionally where um, you try to call somebody uh, and it, the call phone call actually works its way through the phone network, but it gets blocked somewhere because there are not enough resources. And what happens is you get a busy signal. What's really happening there is it's, it bounces the call and it assumes that you're gonna retry by making the call again. Okay, so what they've done there is they've avoided deadlock in the network by pushing you off to doing a retry, okay? This is actually the technique used in Ethernet uh, in some multiprocessor networks where uh, you allow everybody to speak at once on a segment. And if there's a collision, then what happens is you exponentially back off with some randomness and retry. And as a result, the, the problem goes away, okay? So this is a technique of random retry instead of a potential deadlock. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the term. Um, now, it can be inefficient if you don't use the right algorithms. Uh, you know, the goofy thing here is you consider driving to San Francisco and the moment you hit a traffic jam, you're instantly teleported back home and have to retry. That would be an example of, uh, you know, a retry mechanism that probably would never work because you could never make it through. So if you're really going to uh, reject and force a retry, there has to be some notion that there's gonna be eventual success on that channel. Okay. Here's an example of that virtually infinite resource I mentioned earlier. Well, we said this could deadlock if there's only two megabytes in the system, but with virtual memory, you have effectively infinite space. So everyone just gets to go through and you won't deadlock. Okay. Now, of course, it's not actually infinite, but it's certainly a lot larger than two megabytes. Um, how do we prevent deadlocks? Okay, maybe this is a little more interesting. So you make all threads request everything they need at the beginning, and then you check and see if you've got enough resources. And if you do, you get to go, and if you don't, you don't, okay? So if you think about that, there'll never be a situation where you're in the middle of execution, you have some resources, you're waiting for others, you've just basically removed the, the wait portion of that cycle, okay? The problem here, of course, is predicting the future as to what you need for resources, and you often end up overestimating. Um, for the example, if you need two chopsticks, you request both at the same time. Um, that may or may not work well. Uh, yeah, imagine reserving the Bay Bridge. That wouldn't work too well either. Um, you don't leave uh, home until you know no one's using any intersection between here and where you want to go. Uh, that actually works 
pretty well if you're traveling around uh, you know 130 at night across the Bay Bridge. Uh, there might be enough uh, channels there or, or lanes to know for sure you're going to make it without uh, being delayed. Um, you could force all the threads to request resources in a particular order. All right, well, this is more interesting. So for instance, to prevent deadlock, you always acquire X and then Y and then Z, okay? So if you always acquire X and then Y, then Z, you can prove fairly simply that that'll never deadlock because any deadlock involving those resources would have to be a cycle. And therefore a cycle would mean that some thread acquired something like Z and then acquired X or Z and then acquired Y. So any actual cycle in a supposed deadlock would show you going backwards in your acquisition. And as a result, um, can't happen because you always have to get X and then Y and then Z. And this, by the way, is exactly that dimension order uh, routing that we talked about in uh, multiprocessor or train networks earlier, right? So here's an example. So rather than what we showed earlier, where you could get X and then Y and thread A and then Y and then X and B, you just uh, maybe acquire them both. Okay, so here we get both X and Y, both X, uh, Y and X, whatever. Um, either you get them all or you don't. And as a result, there's no cycle. That's the first thing I showed you. The second was um, you maybe get a lock around, uh, you grab Z. Okay, there's no cycle around Z. And if you happen to acquire Z, then you can acquire what you want. Okay. And that won't deadlock because there's no cycle. Or here's the consistent order. So rather X than Y, Y than X, what you do is you always go X than Y, X than Y. Okay, and as a result, it'll never deadlock. Okay. Now, does it matter which order the locks are released? Like notice uh, here, um, we always go X then Y, X then Y, but here I'm releasing Y then X, and here I'm releasing X then Y. Does it matter? Okay, good. It doesn't matter because the only thing I do with releasing is I'm letting people go forward. I'm not holding them up. Right, so the releasing can be done in any order. It's the acquisition that has to happen in the uh, the same order. Um, I will say, however, though, typically you acquire them in one order and you release them in another, and that's just a way of making sure that um, you've got a nice clean pattern there. Um, and this is kind of what we looked at when we were talking about um, the finite buffer queue when we we're when we we're looking at semaphores a little while ago. Train example. Right here is the, the fixing ordering of the channels. You're always getting the X channel and then the Y channel. And as a result, there's no way to have a cycle because any cycle would show you having the Y channel first and then the X channel. Okay, all right. And this works in multiple dimensions, you know, more dimensions. You can have X, Y, Z, W, whatever. Um, as long as you, you get them in a given order, then you don't have deadlock. So how can we recover from deadlock? So here you could terminate the thread force it to give up resources. So that I told you about the Godzilla solution earlier. Um, you hold the dining lawyer in contempt and take, a, take him away in handcuffs. Uh, you make sure you get the um, chopsticks first. Uh, but it's not always possible because killing a thread holding a mutex would actually leave things inconsistent and probably screw everything else up, okay? So taking things away is rarely a good thing. The one instance um, you could preempt resources without killing the thread, but then again, the resources think they have the resources, excuse me, the threads think they have the resources exclusively. You've just taken them away. The thread's gonna not behave correctly, okay? So the one case where this actually works out well is when you have enough information to do a full rollback or an abort. And this is sort of the database idea where uh, before you grab your locks, you have a, checkpoint of the of the state and now you you go ahead and start running if there's ever a deadlock you roll back to a time prior to the deadlock and you restart things uh, maybe with some randomness so the the uh, deadlock doesn't happen again this is a very common technique the databases can use because they can roll back to a consistent state before they retry after detecting a deadlock so this is the one instance where you can just back up and take resources away and retry it uh, and make sure the deadlock doesn't happen again. Okay. Many operating systems have other options, um, but uh, I will say that Unix operations, uh, operating systems often use the denialism technique. So, you know, here's this other view of virtual memory. So we said, well, we could think of infinite space. This isn't a problem. 
Um, if you look one level deep, which will be appropriate, uh, one level deeper, which will be appropriate in the next lecture, is we could say that what actually happens when we run out of memory for one of the threads is we preempt that memory, uh, paging it out to disk and um, giving it back later when we page it back in. And as a result, we can take memory from one thread, that means now DRAM, physical memory, give it to a different thread, and everything's OK, because when we come back, we uh, grab the data and give it back to the thread we took it away from, and we don't let the thread look at it in the middle. And so we find a way to suspend the use, save the state, uh, and avoid the deadlock. Okay, And that's kind of what paging does. Let's talk about avoiding, OK? So when a thread requests a resource, the operating system checks and sees, would it result in deadlock? If not, it grants the resource right away. If so, if there's going to be a deadlock, it waits for the other threads to release resources. So this almost sounds good, right? So the idea is we, we somehow look and we say, will this, re will this thing we're giving it have a deadlock? If so, don't give it the resource, otherwise do. And the issue here is, let's show this example. Here's our thread A and B that could deadlock. We uh, acquire X, no deadlock there. We acquire Y, there's no deadlock there. There's no cycle. We acquire Y, still no deadlock. OK. Now notice at this point, thread A is blocking because it's trying to acquire a resource B has. We still don't have a cycle because B is happily running. Here, we say, oh, if we acquire x, we're going to have a cycle and therefore a deadlock, so we'll wait. Problem is, it's already too late because there's already impossible, it's already impossible for this situation to resolve, even though there isn't a cycle at the moment you try to acquire x. So we have to do something a little better here. And so here I'm going to introduce three states. There's the safe state, which is the system can uh, delay the resource acquisition to prevent deadlock. So this is a situation where we can make forward progress and we won't deadlock. There's deadlock where we're in trouble, right? And we already have a cycle. And then there's an unsafe state where there's no deadlock yet, but threads uh, could request resources in a pattern that will unavoidably lead to deadlock. That's what we had in that previous slide. We already had an unsafe state, OK? And actually, the deadlock state's considered unsafe as well, because once you're deadlocked, it's not safe. So deadlock avoidance is preventing the system from reaching an unsafe state. So how do we do that? So for instance, when a thread requests a resource, OS checks and sees if it would result in an unsafe state. If not, it grants the resource. If so, it waits. So how this changes our example is thread A grabs X. Everybody's good. Thread B tries to grab Y, but we look and we say, oh, if we acquire Y, we're already down the path to an, inev an inevitable deadlock. And therefore, thread B is not even allowed to acquire Y. Okay, If we could come up with that, then what happens is B goes you know, to sleep and is stalled. A goes on to acquire Y, does its thing, releases the two. At that point, B gets released, and now we're good to go, and we don't have any deadlock. So this algorithm that I've sort of implied has somehow kept us in a safe state, and therefore we don't deadlock. And that's kind of what we'd like to do. So we have something called the Baker's algorithm. So toward the right idea is state the maximum at the beginning of resources you need, and you allow a particular thread to proceed only if the total number of resources minus the number I'm requesting still says that there's an amount. It's a, the remaining is greater than the maximum that anybody needs. So we take the current available minus what I'm asking for. And as long as what's left is greater or than or equal to the max that anybody will need, I'm good to go. Why is that OK? Well, that says basically that, um, gee, even though I've been given these resources, uh, there's always somebody that can complete. So this is not quite what we want. This is a little too uh, conservative. Okay. Instead, the banker's algorithm is a little less conservative, and it's going to let you uh, ask for resources, free them, ask for them, free them, so on. And what we're going to do is every time somebody asks for a request, we'll grant it as long as there is some way for the threads to run such that they will complete without a deadlock. So we only run 
we only grant a resource if there's some way to complete without a dead box. So the technique here is to pretend that we grant the resource that's being asked for, and then we run the deadlock detection algorithm. And in that case, we're going to substitute this, which is say, take the maximum that anybody wants, uh, take the maximum that a given node wants minus the amount they have um, and see whether it's less than what's available. And we're going to replace that for what we asked about earlier, which is um, you know, seeing whether what we're requesting is, is uh, less than what's available. Okay, And so here, notice that in this deadlock detection algorithm, we're going to say that for every node, instead of if requesting the amount we're requesting is less than what's available, we're going to say if uh, we take the maximum we need minus how much we have is less than what's available, then we're gonna, we can finish. Okay, And so this is like that simulation that I talked about earlier, where for um, we temporarily grant the thread that's asking for something. And then we go through and we say, is there a way to, to let some thread finish and then let some th other thread finish and so on, as long as there's still a path through that allow the thread, some the whole set of threads to finish, we're not deadlocked and we're still in a safe state. Okay. So basically that algorithm, as simple as it is, which is substituting this into the deadlock freedom algorithm, keeps the system in a safe state, which says there's always a sequence T1, T2 to Tn, where T1 completes, then T2 completes, and so on. There's always a path out, even if I pretend to give the resource. And if that's true, then I go ahead and give the resource. Okay. So the way you need to think of the banker's algorithm, I realize I'm a little bit low on time. Just give me a few more minutes. The way to think about the banker's algorithm is that it's a simulation of what would happen if I granted the resource to the thread, would I still be able to find a way out such that every thread completes? And if the answer is yes, then go ahead and give it. Okay. And this is a, an actual algorithm that we could run on every acquire and release of every resource that would prevent us from deadlocking. And it would actually uh, do th run that uh, example I showed you earlier, where we grab X and grab y, and in the other case, grab y and then x. This particular algorithm would actually prevent that from ever deadlocking because thread B would be forced to wait until thread A was fully done in that instance. Okay. So in some examples here, if you think through the banker's algorithm, what you would find is that a safe state, which is one that doesn't uh, cause deadlock, is if when you try to grab a, a chopstick, either it's not the last chopstick, or it is the last chopstick, but somebody else has two. If either of these conditions are correct, then um, you're going to still be in a safe state and you can allow that chopstick to be acquired. Um, where this gets a little bit amusing is you could imagine the K-handed lawyer case, which is you don't allow if it's the last one and no one would have K chopsticks, or it's the second to last one and no one would have K minus one and so on. Okay. So um, we're about done here. Yes, uh, we can actually do a, a, a K-handed lawyer's case. So I want to pause for two seconds about whether there's any uh, questions here, and then I'm going to finish up. So you have to think about the, the way you think about the banker's algorithm is on every acquire or release of every resource, you pretend that you give that resource. The kernel does this. It pretends it's going to give that resource. It runs that special deadlock detection algorithm and says, am I going to go into deadlock uh, or is there a path out of this? If there's a path out, then it will grant the resource. If there is not a path out, then it won't grant the resource and instead put that thread to sleep until there are enough resources. All right. Good. So the question, of course, is do most OSs implement this? So as I already told you, Unix, uh, essentially uses the ostrich approach or uh, deadlock denialism. Um, however, uh, if you cared, you could implement this. So there are some specialized OSs that do do this. The second thing that's kind of interesting is I think shown by this page here, which is you can use the, the uh, banker's algorithm to design a way of accessing resources that won't deadlock. So you can use the banker's algorithm as a way of designing how you go about uh, asking for resources in a given um, in a given application, 
then you don't actually need the uh, banker's algorithm running live because you've set it up so that it's running as part of your actual application. Okay. And you could even run a banker's algorithm library inside of, a, of an application instead of uh, the operating system. All right. So we talked about the four conditions for deadlocks. We talked about mutual exclusion, which is that when you get a resource, you uh, have exclusively hold of it. Hold and wait, which is I hold on to other resources while I'm waiting for ones that I'm looking for. No preemption says I can't take resources away. Circular wait, there's at least a cycle in the system. All four of these are required. These are necessary, but not sufficient for deadlock. We talked about techniques for, address, for uh, basically addressing the deadlock problem. We can either prevent it by writing our code so it won't be prone to deadlock. We can, um, that includes things like uh, dimension order routing. We can avoid, uh, the, uh, so that's avoiding the deadlock. We can recover uh, from deadlocks by uh, rolling back. We can avoid it entirely uh, by something like the banker's algorithm, or we can totally ignore the possibility, um, which unfortunately a, a lot of things do. All right. I think we're good for today um, and look forward to um, uh, the results of the midterm grading coming out. And again, it was a little longer than we intended. We apologize for that. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend. Um, everybody, I hope that you can get outside and that the air improves a little bit. Ciao.